Back in 1988, Anatoly Pshenichnyuk's UFAR archaeological expedition did not manage to complete the excavations of a truly enormous burial amount in the Orenburg region before the ground froze. This burial structure was the largest in a world-famous site of nomadic culture, the burial ground of Filipovka I. It was originally over 7 meters high, and its diameter exceeded 100 meters. Given its size, the mound was considered royal. The part of the mound which was not excavated completely, the so-called residual hill, attracted the attention of black market diggers. Every summer, before the beginning of the dig season, more and more new damages were discovered. The mound had to be protected from further looting and destruction. The decision to do additional excavations was made with the support of the Ministry of Culture and External Relations of the Orenberg region and the Akmula Bashkir State Pedagogical University under Dr. Obidinova. The field and in-office work were organized and financed by the Institute of Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. In August of 2013, the Urals Archaeological Expedition, headed by Dr. Leonid Yablonsky, resumed the digging of the Filipovka I burial mound. Unfortunately, Scythian and Sarmatian burial mounds have always been the object of overt looting. The work carried out by Leonid Yablonsky truly rescued the site, saved it. Now these items can only stay well preserved if kept in the museum. Initially, they only planned to investigate the remainder of the burial mound and bring the study of this world-famous archaeological site to a logical conclusion. Nothing there promised a sensational discovery. From Pshenichnyuk's report, we know that there were signs of an underground passage going towards the excavated part of the mound. And it was indeed possible to find it. The passage began on the edge of the site, under the burial, at the level of the ancient surface and led to the central grave pit under the mound. Five steps led down into this underground gallery. The entrance was about 30 meters long and about 0.8 meters wide. Such underground passages are typical of the large burial mounds architecture of the Philip of Kawan necropolis of the South Ural steppes, and they had a ritual purpose. Not far from the entrance, a unique discovery was made. A massive cast bronze cauldron, its size is unparalleled in the southern Urals and is comparable to the large pits of the rich tombs of Scythian chieftains. With a diameter of just over a meter, the cauldron weighed about 500 kilograms and looked like a ball with a rounded bottom and a drip tray. Two of the four handles were made in the scytho siberian animal-style tradition. They were three-dimensional heraldic images of the heads of two griffins, mythical royal animals, with their big statue. The bowl of the cauldron below the rim was decorated with a zigzag relief ornament. The cauldron itself was placed inside the underground passage as if blocking the entrance to the central tomb. During the excavations, the archaeologists also unearthed numeral sacrificial memorial sets consisting of iron and bronze horse harness parts, a fragment of a stone altar, and many horse skeletons. All this was located on the ancient surface under the mound. Further research revealed another interesting object, a grave pit with dimensions of 5.15 by 3.27 meters. In ancient times, this pit was dug down from the surface of the mound, which means that it was originally 6 meters deep. The pit was covered with logs. Inside, it was filled with dense layers of soil. It took a truly heroic effort by third-year history students at Bashkir State Pedagogical University to get through the densest layers of soil. But the result was a great success. A woman's skeleton was found at the bottom of the grave, on a layered bed of bark, reeds and grass. Anthropological research revealed that the woman found in the grave died at the age of about 35. It was a woman of very high social status. She must have been a priestess. And this time it was not a family priestess, but a priestess of a whole community, a population. The reconstruction made by Leonid Yablonsky made it possible to imagine what this woman looked like in those long gone years. She was stretched out on her back with her head facing south. 
Near the buried woman were found elements of her richly decorated clothing. This probably included, among other things, four rounded plaques depicting a coiled saiga placed on her sternum and 26 rectangular plaques depicting a feline predator attacking a hoofed animal. Leonid Yablonsky investigated this intact burial place meticulously photographing everything. Why is that not only artifacts, which are of course of great interest to archaeologists, are so important, but also the historical context of the find? Because without the historical context, the findings say very little. From the archaeological context, it is possible to surmise and recreate the historical women's clothing and how it was all connected. The plaques were located along the outer side of both arms, from the shoulder to the wrist, which suggests that the woman was buried wearing a dress with long, narrow sleeves. Under both arms of the woman, from the middle of the shoulder to the middle of the forearm, there were two clusters of multicolored beads and smaller gold, coral and stone beads. These were wide ribbons, folded in half. Perhaps there were a decorative embellishment of another sleeveless piece of clothing worn over the dress. The ribbons show a procession of animals, ten reindeer following one another. The reindeer were made using an original technique, but they correspond with the animalistic style of other items also found in the Philip of Necropolis. The shawl with round gold flower-shaped plaques was a unique find. The front side of the shawl is decorated with a fringe of miniature gold plaques and pendants. Their arrangement suggested the woman's face was covered during the burial ritual. When buried, the woman was wearing a jewellery set made of two bracelets, ten rings for each finger, and two sets of pendants framing the edges of the sleeves of the dress at the wrist. The pendants consisted of carnelian cylindrical beads framed in gold. They had drop-shaped pendants on them, which were decorated with glass cloisonne in red, blue and green colours. The bracelets were made of various stone, glass and gold beads and pendants. On each finger, the woman wore similar gold-cast rings with rectangular plates and an image of an animal. A deer with tucked legs, whose branching horns were stylized to look like griffins with downwards pointing beaks. Two cast gold pendants with a diamond pattern were found on the buried woman in the area of the temples, decorated with two camel heads, chains and polychrome drop-shaped pendants. The right temple pendant had an additional element, a cap depicting two rams, face in front of the body. Two imprints of red and black lines were visible on the frontal bone of the skull. These may have been the remains of a headband. The burial was completed with a rich and varied inventory. On the right side of the woman's head stood a wooden vessel with a lid made of moose antler, decorated with gold ornamental plates on the rim. On one of the plates was a hollow composite figure of a female kulon, an animal similar to a donkey, without horns. The round lid of the vessel has a handle in the center with an engraved depiction of a griffin head in a characteristic animal style. To the left of the headboard was a wicker box filled with a variety of objects. On top were two cast silver files. Next to it was a leather box filled with scarab beetles and rhinoceros beetles. Glass, wooden and silver vessels, bone and bronze needles, felt balls, stone tools, pebbles, shells, a molded sensor, chestnut shells and many other interesting little things were found there too. The box also contained a wooden vessel with gold ornaments and a handle in the shape of a bear. Between the box and the skull was a gold plaque with a disc in the center, decorated with colored inserts and pendants. The drawing on the disc is made in the cloisonne technique. The inserts are made of blue and red-orange transparent and turquoise opaque glass. The central composition is divided into two tiers. In the upper tier is an image of the deity in the form of an eagle with outstretched wings. On its chest is the sun. In the center of the lower tier, below the deity, is a simplified world tree. On either side of the tree are two mythical birds called sea mergs, made of gold leaf. 
Their profiles looking in different directions form a heraldic composition. Along the edge of the disc are intricately woven chains decorated with three kinds of pendants. Tend in the bark case, there is a silver mirror with a gilded handle. This is an open work image of two deer figures, and the space between them is filled with branching antlers. On the reverse side of the mirror disc, in the center, is a bird of prey with outstretched wings, spread legs with long claws and a fanned tail, and six figures of winged bulls following each other in a circle. Another circular pattern is floral, with blossoming and closed flowers. Near and under the mirror, there were various minerals and pigments which were probably used for makeup, as well as different types of stone and bone beads, stones, gold patches, pendants, plates, a bone and bronze spoon, six gold needles, iron knives, a sharpening stone, and many other things. More items were found at the feet of the woman on her right. There was a leather strap with bronze bells attached to it, a large marble bead, more beads, seashells, drilled walnuts, pottery, bronze and stone beads, bronze pendants with pictures of birds, many different stones, a bone spoon, a horse fang with red ochre inside, powders and minerals. Two stone pellets for rubbing and mixing tattoo pigments were the centerpiece of this set. Bronze, silver and wooden dishes and bowls with sacrificial food and a marble alabaster, a special vessel for storing aromatic oils and liquids, were placed at the bottom of the burial. A bridal set and a quiver with arrows were also put in the woman's grave. The quiver was decorated with gold details and pendants made of jasper and chalk. The excavation of this incredibly well-preserved female burial from the 4th century BC gave the scholars and the general public alike new sensational findings and materials that will make a huge contribution to the study of the history and culture of the nomads of the southern Urals. All participants of the expedition, from the students to its head, understood that such kind of professional luck happens once in a lifetime and did their best to complete the work despite the difficulties and weather conditions. The archaeologists had to deal with the task of excavating the not-so-small mound in record time, in a single summer season, to salvage the remaining objects from being destroyed in it. Eight long years passed since the discovery of this unique burial site before the preserved fragments of the embroidery were handed over to the conservator Natalia Sinitsina. When I opened the box, it was just compressed sand with beads of different colors peeking through here and there. At first, a comprehensive study of the materials used to make the rosette-shaped plaques and numerals beads from the Filipovka burial site was conducted. Using the methods of micro X-ray fluorescence analysis and optical and electron microscopy, we were able to determine the nature of the origin and elemental composition of the alloys of the objects. Further research was done at the Common Use Center of the Institute of Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. The analysis of the gold beads by scanning electron microscopy made it possible to establish that sheet gold with a precious metal content of 84 to 85 percent was used to make them. The triple alloy, gold, silver and copper, from which the beads were made, is a type of gold alloy typical of Greek jewellery tradition. The gold beads vary in shape from almost round to biconical, in part almost cylindrical, with a pronounced bend in the middle, measuring approximately 3 mm. Proceeding with the restoration of the embroidery fragments, it was essential to develop a method of primary cleaning of beads and gold plaques. With wooden sticks, they were cleaned from soil deposits and traces of glue. They were then thoroughly washed in a solution of water and alcohol. Using a bristle brush, the surface of the metal was cleaned of glue and residual soil deposits. As the layers were dismantled, the individual sections of the embroidery were carefully photographed and maps were made of the locations of the preserved beads. Each bead was marked on the map chart and transferred to a specially prepared work surface covered with plasticine, following the preserved embroidery pattern. The mechanical cleaning of the beads from traces of glue, dirt and sand was done using brushes of different hardness and thin needles. 
Sandstone beads were additionally reinforced with a special compound. All the other beads required a gentle approach. That is, each bead had to be held, each bead had to be pierced to get rid of the sand inside, and then we had to put a thread through it. It was a very difficult and very long process. The next stage of the work involved the preparation of the backing material, a silk gauze tinted light brown. After the cleaning and conservation, the embroidery elements were transferred from the marble to the silk gauze in a small hoop and attached to it. At the final stage of the work, the scattered fragments were assembled and stitched together on specially prepared cotton fabric, following the original embroidery tracing. Behind are a year and a half of meticulous work. Natalia Sinitsana managed to preserve and restore the fragments of the beaded embroidery which adorned the dress of the Sarmatian priestess. The restored fragments of the beaded embroidery, as well as the most interesting and important items found during archaeological expeditions led by Anatoly Pchenichnyuk and Leonid Yablonsky, took their rightful place at the exhibition Gold of the Sarmatian Chieftains at the Pushkin State Museum. And the presentation of this collection not only in Russia, but hopefully also abroad. Because of the work that was done on this subject alone, it astonishes with its abundance of enthusiastic people, the labor that went into it and the research itself. In my opinion, it will be a worthy example, which will encourage scholars to pay attention to the collection of gold on display. And the most wonderful thing is that through museum methods, we tell about this object in terms of its entering into a scholarly discourse, in terms of its popularization. And also, we tell people about one of the important symbols, brands not only of the Orenburg region, but also of Russia in general, this collection of Sarmatian gold. Значимых символов брендов не только Оренбургской области, но и вообще России это коллекция сарматского золота.